Father, thank you for the chance uh, in these days we have together to practice your presence and to practice this um, alternative story uh, that is so different from the story our world gives us about who we are, who you are, what the problem is, what the solution is. And it struck me as we were singing that so many of us in this room are trying to figure out if we really are going to commit ourselves to this other story that we are rehearsing here these days. And I pray for my friends who are um, sitting here early in their lives trying to figure out, is this really true? <laughs> is this the realest thing there is? And I pray that you would meet them. And I pray that, um, as I did when I was their age, uh, as those of us who are leaders here did at various times in our lives, that they would come to a point of saying, I want to be part of your story, God. I want this to be more than just songs that I mouth or words that I repeat because they were given to me by my family and my church, but that this would become the real story that shapes um, our lives. And because that cannot happen on our own, we invite your presence, Holy Spirit, to change us, to make us people who want to live your story. And we invite you, Lord Jesus, to remake us into your image. And Father of Jesus, sender of the Spirit, we acknowledge you as the wonderful, beautiful, glorious Lord we just sang about, in whom there is nothing better, there's nothing we can desire that isn't found in you. I pray that that would become real to us and that we would take that reality out into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's start with this. Let's, uh, how many of you had a chance to look at Genesis 2 at some point in the last few hours? All right, mo most of you. So um, let's talk about, uh, do you remember the story of the barbecue? All right, so we've got the barbecue from the Enuma Elish, that's the name of the Babylonian epic, and we've got the garden, Genesis 2, from uh, the Hebrew Bible and our Bible. Um, so could you uh, turn to your neighbor and talk about the differences between the barbecue story and the garden story. What does the garden story tell us about who God is and who we are that's different from we got, what we got from the, gar uh, the barbecue story? Actually, I just got a really good question. Tell me your name. I don't know your name. William. From Williams. He said, uh, I think your question was, uh, the sky gods love to smell the aroma of uh, burning flesh, right? But I think you were asking, where does where is, where is the flesh come from if the world hasn't been made yet, right? Well, we all, the Enuma Elish, we only have fragments of it, so we don't have the whole story. We have to kind of piece it together because it's on clay tablets that decompose, so, so we can piece together. We don't know exactly how they thought all this came about, but somehow the sky gods loved the aroma of, this, of the, the meat on the grill. Uh, so let's hear a few contrasts. What is different about the garden versus this story I told you from the Enuma Elish? And uh, how about you stand up and like tell the whole group? Do you mind? Yeah. You're brave. You were yesterday. <laughs> um, well, there's an obvious. There's it's a garden and a barbecue. You know, there's like two different things. So there's no reality. Okay. And what is what's the difference between those two like, realities? Like the, like the meat, and then um, there's like Ah, so actually, the food involved is different. That's awesome. You can take a seat. Uh, in, the, in the barbecue scenario, what's the best thing to eat? Meat, right? I kind of, I, I can relate to this. I love barbecue of many kinds, especially brisket is my thing. Uh, but, but the story of Genesis 2, there is no eating, there's no killing and eating of animals to benefit human beings or God. God doesn't eat, eat animals, and human beings don't eat animals. Uh, that actually comes later. It comes after Noah uh, is the first time in the Bible that animals are given to human beings to eat. It's a very complicated story as to why we now kill and eat animals. But that's not the vision at the beginning of Genesis 2. Fruits and vegetables just grow, and when you harvest them, uh, it doesn't cause them pain. They don't, uh, they don't resist. Uh, and it's a very different picture of what eating is about uh, and, and what God delights in in the Babylonian story versus the... Genesis, two story. Really interesting. Yes? Um, the barbecue one, the gods just like lay back, but our God, he like works through us. Yes. Ooh. Ah, there's a kind of cooperation. How did you see that in Genesis 2? 
Well, where did you see God oh, working through us or helping us? Like, he um, made Adam, and then he passed, like, Adam and Eve, and then he made Eve, and then he helped Adam out. Wow. So there's this sort of increasing cooperation, right? God first has Adam and asks for his help. Does that mean God's like, Adam, I'm so glad you're here. I, I was so tired taking care of this garden. Now it's your job. No. Doesn't seem that way, right? Now, God, what, what do we know? At the beginning of Genesis 3, it tells us God would walk in the garden every day with them. It was their work to do. That was their task on, on the earth. But God's there with them. It's not like the sky gods who are just laying back in their lazy boy saying, come on, get the, get the aroma going. And then there's this addition of another helper. It's not good for, so Adam is a word that, it sounds just like the Hebrew for earth. So I like to translate Adam, earthling. Uh, it's not good for the earthling to be alone. And now there's going to be two who will help each other. And uh, the woman is given to the man as a helper. And by the way, that word helper is used mostly in the Bible for a, an, an army that comes to help another army win a battle. So never think that that word that describes the woman is, is a, a word merely of um, kind of meekly assisting when called upon. It's like the, if you are fighting a battle and you don't have enough people, you hope an azer, that's the Hebrew word, you hope an azer will come, a, help, a helping army will come and help you win the battle. That's what Eve is for Adam. That's what the woman is for the man. So there's increasing cooperation in the story between God and human beings and then between human beings. Okay, what else? Yeah, nice and loud. Whoa! In the, in the Babylonian story, humans are put there to work, but in the, in the Genesis story, humans are put there to prosper. Does that mean they don't work? Interesting. So there's a kind of work that's actually part of our own flourishing. It's not just for somebody else's benefit, but it's for our own flourishing. That's great. Maybe one more thing? What else? Anything else that hasn't been said? That... Barbecue tastes better, Andy says. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I think the trees and plants in the garden probably tasted better than we can imagine. Uh, so uh, we, we'll have to think about what role bacon has in this story in the long run. I'm not sure. So here's the thing. Your picture of work will depend on your myth of creation. Everybody has a myth of creation. That is, they have a story of how the world came into being and who human beings are in that story. And your, your picture of work depends on the creation story you tell. At the time when Genesis was originally told and written down, the most powerful story in the world was this conflict story of the Babylonian epic. It was a story of violence, a story of domination, a story of exploitation. And that reflected work in the empire of Babylon. That is what work was like. The weak served the strong, the lesser uh, worked for the benefit of the greater. Um, but the Genesis story comes along and tells this totally different story. Now, how many people in our world believe that the world is composed of two halves of a, a fish goddess of chaos? None, right? But we do have an alternative creation story in our time that is told by the most powerful empire in the world, that is backed up with all kinds of evidence that seems like it tells us this is the way the world is. What is that story? So this is tricky. <laughs> I would say it is the story of what I'm going to call evolutionism, which I'm going to distinguish from evolution. I'm going to tell you that I myself believe that God created all human life through the process of evolution that evolutionary biologists study and teach. You, you can decide for yourselves, and your church will help you decide whether you want to believe that or not. I fully believe that, that all life in the world came into being through this amazing process with the ordering of DNA that gave rise to the abundance of species. So I, I'm not saying that life did not evolve over a long period of time on this planet. I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that. However, our culture, since the time of Charles Darwin, has told a whole creation myth out of that set of scientific facts. And what does it tell us? Let's uh, think out loud about this with me. What does the, the sort of creation myth, that is the story that tells you the meaning of it, it doesn't just, a creation myth doesn't just tell you how it happened. In fact, it may not care much about how it happens, but it wants, it wants to tell you what it means. 
What, what has evolution told us is the meaning of being a human being or the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life in the story that we get just from investigating the history that evolutionary biology can tell us? Survival, somebody said. Why? Why, why is survival crucial to evolution? Because there's competition. There's uh, competition for scarce resources. What were you going to say, Kai? You want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. And so every, the way that it's been thought of is every creature is trying to survive. This gets a little more complicated in later Darwin, neo-Darwinian theory, but every creature is trying to survive. And the basic thing individuals are trying to do is sort of eke out life in the world, right? And, and in order to do that, what do they do? In the story that we tend to tell. Anyone know? They fight each other. They compete with each other for scarce resources to occupy niches in which they can survive. Now, what are human beings in this story? Are, it's interesting. We're no different in this story, right? There's nothing in this story that makes us any categorically different from the other creatures. So we also are just in a competition for survival against each other and against other species. Now, here's the fascinating thing. It turns out that model of what evolution is is breaking down for evolutionary biologists. They are discovering that competition is not enough to explain the abundance of species and the proliferation of life. I can't prove this to you right now, but I, two weeks ago I was with some of the top evolutionary biologists in the world in San Francisco at a conference, and I heard the most amazing presentations about how the idea that just competition can lead to speciation and greater and greater diversity of species is proving it doesn't account for it at all. Do you know what the next uh, frontier of evolutionary biology is? It's studying the role of cooperation in the profusion of life. And it turns out that as life gets more complex, it becomes more cooperative. So single-celled organisms don't cooperate with each other in hardly any way. They do kind of pretty much just compete. If one amoeba meets another amoeba, it tries to eat that amoeba. And they don't, they don't look at each other and say, hey, fellow amoeba, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, how can we work together? They don't say that. Um, there is kind of a baseline competition at, at the single-celled organism level. But the more complex life gets, the more cooperative it gets, and the more oriented we become towards finding another and working together. And it turns out you can't explain, many biologists now believe, you cannot explain the evolution of the world, of life in the world, without uh, giving a huge role to cooperation. But is, have you, how many of you have heard that before? One, one person who's a fellow geek like me and, and reads this stuff and pays attention. It's not yet taught. It's not part of our myth. The myth is still everything came into being through, essentially through violence, uh, competition between species and between individuals and species. That turns out not to be the case. So when you were born, the first thing you did, to, what was the, anyone know what the first thing is you did when you were born? After you cried, before you ate, probably. Sleep. Not sleep. Breathe. No. You, you did breathe. But you, you, you sought something. What did you, you sought something. You looked for something. Do you know what you looked for? You looked for a face. Human beings, when they're born, they immediately look for a human face. They look for another person. And I, this happened to me especially vividly when my son was born. They handed him to me moments after he was born. And his eyes, I was holding him in my arms, and those eyes fixed on my face and thought, I found another. Human beings are designed to connect with each other. Other animals don't necessarily do this, but we do this. And we are the most complex creatures on the planet, by far. And we are the most cooperative creatures. So here's, I want to draw uh, just a quick implication of this for, for our work. There's two ways of thinking about work in the world. And one is basically built on the old Darwinian myth. It's a myth. It doesn't even match the full science of competition for survival. And it says that all work is about kind of carving out a competitive space in which you can succeed at the expense of someone else. And one phrase we use for this, economists use for that, is, this is zero sum. It's a zero sum environment where if I get more, you get less. It always has to end up to zero in the end. And so the more I have, the less you have. And we're in competition, each of us, to get more at the expense of the other. 
But it actually turns out there's a totally different way to think about work, which is in terms of cooperation. That actually when human beings order the world, when we structure the world in ways that we can through our reason, our skill, our memory, our attention to the world, that actually the world becomes more abundant. It's not zero sum. It actually more and more abundance emerges as you order it. And so as we work, there's actually more to go around. Rather than just one pie that we all have to fight over, it's actually a pie factory <laughs> that can create more and more abundance. So I want us to think about this for a moment. Who had to cooperate? Who had to work, do sometimes very hard work, for us to get to have this uh, few days together in this room. Let's, let's start listing. In fact, do this with your neighbor. Turn to your neighbor, and I'm going to give you two minutes. In two minutes, make as long a list as you can of the people who had to cooperate and work together for us to have this experience. What kind of work did they have to do? How many different kinds of work had to be done for us to be here? Go ahead. What were some kinds of work that had to be done for us to be here? Andy. Okay, so all of our churches, there were uh, leaders and uh, people who worked at all of our churches to organize all this, to collect the forms and so forth. Okay, let's get uh, folks from the back. The people in the front raise their hands too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, you. Uh, the drivers. Aha, people had to drive. And what did they have to drive, by the way? A car. Oh, who made the car? A bunch of people, right? An incredibly complex process to make that car. What did that car run on, by the way? How did it? Uh, oh, how did the gasoline get here? People had to extract it from the ground. They had to refine it. They had to pump it, deliver it. OK. What else? What other categories? What, sorry? The building. Uh, did somebody have to design this building? Yes. Who, how many people worked on building this building? How many people do you think were involved? 400, 500 people had to work on creating this space. OK, yes, in the back. The hotel staff. OK, so right now, a bunch of people are working to keep the lights on, to keep the water hot, to prepare the food that, that we'll eat later, uh, to keep the water park going. There's a whole bunch of staff who are working right now while we're sitting in here to add order so that we can experience a kind of abundance. OK, a couple more things. Yes. <laughs> so we had economic resources that were made available, some from our parents, some from our church, and some came from a family, the Kern family. Does anyone know anything about the Kern family? So they gave thousands of dollars, I think, so that we could be here, right? How many thousand? 37, so they gave $37,000. Now the way, does anyone know where, they, where did they get that $37,000? Anyone know specifically what they did? Mr. Kern was an, was an electrical engineer, and he realized that uh, there was a huge opportunity to create electrical generators that were standalone generators, uh, that, so that you could have an alternative to the power grid when the power went out or when you needed supplemental power. And so he founded this company called Generac. It's now been bought by a bigger company. And the Kerns sold that company, which employed thousands of people, making very high quality, they're the, the highest quality generators you can buy are Generac generators in their market and their niche. And they cooperated, created this new product that now you can see, when you drive around, watch for, you'll see these little boxes that none of us pay attention to outside big buildings or sometimes even outside homes, and they have the Generac label on them. And every time I see a Generac label, I think of Mr. Kern and the business he built that created this really good thing, good in and of itself, to have this kind of power generation, but now has blessed all of us. We are all here, literally, we are here. I got, oh, by the way, I got on a plane. People had to fly the plane, they had to fuel the plane, they had to build the plane, design the plane. I got here because the Kearns worked really, really hard and carefully, cooperated with thousands of people, uh, and created flourishing for us. Yeah, Jerry. You can buy a Generac generator at Menards in Cambridge. Yeah, so Menards, you can go get one. It's a great Christmas gift for your family. Uh, go uh, bring home a generator. Your parents will be so surprised. So here's the point. For us to enjoy the flourishing that we get to enjoy here, literally millions of people are entailed in that. We didn't even mention the clothes we're all wearing. Um, the, we didn't talk about the water park and all that went into building that and maintaining that. What's that? all the time that's involved. 
And there's two ways to think about this. You can think about it with basically a conflict myth, which is, well, all that happened because people were competing. And I'm not saying there isn't an element of competition in, in good work. There actually is an element of competition in good work. Just like in good sports, there's an element of competition. Even in play, there's an element of competition. But the deeper reality, I believe, is told by this biblical story that says human beings are made for cooperation. And good work is human beings working together. It's not good for the, the Adam, the earthling, to be alone. It's the cooperative discovery of how much abundance there is in the world. How many pies? <laughs> Do said, I'm thinking about pies now. So you're going to be thinking about pies, and your, your belly will be grumbling. How many pies can come out of this world? Because coiled within every chemical bond is an incredible amount of energy, and then coiled within every nuclear bond in every atom. Every atom has enough uh, nuclear uh, potential, has enough power potential to power this hotel for a day. There is unbelievable abundance built into the world. And as human beings cooperate in ever more complex ways, we're able to unlock more of that abundance. That's not the story you're going to get from a conflict cosmogony, a conflict story of how the universe came into being. But I actually think it is a true story. Now, this is where we're going to take a turn. Hmm. That doesn't feel totally right, does it? How many of you are feeling a little uncomfortable with this? You should be. Why are you feeling uncomfortable? I'm not thinking you said should be. <laughs> Suddenly you're feeling uncomfortable. You're feeling very uncomfortable. You should be feeling uncomfortable because actually the problem is, so I'm wearing a shirt. It's a basic shirt. It came from Land's End. And the problem is I can almost guarantee, now, I, uh, the person who sold me this shirt, I, well, for one thing, I don't know their name. So that's a bit of a problem. There wasn't real face-to-face -face cooperation. I, it was all done kind of mechanically. I ordered it online. It arrived. And so how good is that person's work, I wonder? The person who worked in that warehouse and shipped this shirt to me. Well, because it's Land's End and because I know a little bit about the company, I'm guessing it was an OK job. And maybe they have some pretty good benefits and pretty good collaboration and cooperation with their um, employers. But then I think about the factory where the shirt was made, which is probably in Pakistan. And then I think, ooh, I hope Land's End paid attention to how good the conditions were in that factory. And I'm not sure, to be totally honest. I don't know for sure what the conditions were. I got my t-shirt yesterday. Uh, and Deuce and I were talking about how much they cost. And I started thinking it was 9 bucks or something like that. And I started to think, OK, so how much of that went to the person who actually spun the cloth for that t-shirt, for the t-shirts a lot of us are wearing? And when you start tracing back from the flourishing we're experiencing right now to a lot of the work that human beings have to do in the world, you get to jobs that are not just um, hard work. There's nothing wrong with hard work. There's nothing undignified about hard work. But you get to jobs very often when you get to the sourcing of the materials we use, the energy that we benefit from, you get to a lot of exploitation. And even the most privileged jobs, people who occupy very high status occupations often find their work nothing like this beautiful vision of the garden where human beings are cooperating with God to bring abundance out of his world. Something has gone really wrong in this story and that's what I want to talk about for the rest of our time together today. Speaking of time, do I have till 11.30? Yeah. All right. So I want to explain what went wrong this way. There's two things the image bearers, us, have more than any other creature. And the first is authority. Human beings have more authority than any other creature. And if you want a definition of authority, you can call it capacity for meaningful action. We're able to act with authority in the world. I'm trying to do this right now. I'm, I've been given some authority. I've been given this microphone that amplifies my voice. I've been given this time. And I'm trying to act meaningfully. I'm trying to say something that will connect with you, right? Um, and human beings have more authority than any other creature. We've been able to fill the earth. Every other creature fills an ecological niche. What's the ecological niche that human beings fill? All of them. Everyone. We're on every single continent, every single uh, ecosystem. I human beings are even in Antarctica, <laughs> um, where you know only penguins and I don't know seals. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
human beings are even in, yes, that we have now actually been able to go into the heavens. We're even in space where nothing can live, but we have enough authority, capacity to structure the world that we can even survive uh, as astronauts and imagine traveling even to another planet. No other creature comes close to being able to do this. Human beings have more authority than any other creature. And by the way, along with this comes a sense of responsibility for other creatures. So I look out my window. We have a beautiful uh, backyard that leads to a creek. And I look out the window, and there are these squirrels in the backyard. And I have dis developed a great interest in the squirrels in my backyard. And I've noticed that they have no interest in me. Like, I'll stop, and I'll just watch the squirrels. And I'll, I'll just enjoy watching them do their squirrel thing. They never stop and look at me doing my thing. Because I have authority, I have dominion, to use the Genesis word, over these squirrels in a way that they don't have for me. Human beings have far more authority than any other creature. And at the same time, it turns out we have something else more than any other creature, and that is vulnerability. And so to find vulnerability is exposure to meaningful risk. That when you're vulnerable, something's at risk. There's something that's at stake that you might lose that you care about. And it turns out that human beings are more vulnerable than any other creature as well. So when a human being is born, when we're born as a baby, uh, how, how able are we to protect ourselves or defend ourselves? Not at all. When less complex creatures are born, how quickly are, are they able to provide for themselves? The less complex, the more quickly a, cre a creature is able to provide for itself. So an amoeba you know, splits by my meiosis or whatever that's called, mitosis, <laughs> or whatever they do. Um, a, an amoeba generates another amoeba. It immediately can do its own thing. It, it has very little dependence. But a human being, how long are we dependent on other human beings uh, from the day we're born? Three or four years? Uh, <laughs> kind of forever? A long time, right? To be dependent on other human beings is, is risk. Because what happens if those other human beings don't care for you, don't care for your flourishing? We are far more vulnerable than any other creature. The, the biblical uh, account, Genesis 3, uh, puts this in a way that I think is very interesting. It says, the man and the woman were naked, though without shame. The man and the woman were naked, though without shame. And I think that's a way of saying, they were vulnerable. Because what is, it, what is it to be naked? It's to be vulnerable to your environment. You're at risk from your environment, especially in Minnesota. <laughs> it was 33 degrees this morning. I'm like, whoa, that's really cold for October, where I come from. Like, if I walk out with no clothes into a Minnesota October afternoon, I'm in trouble in a, a few hours, let alone December or January, right? So we're vulnerable to the environment. But, of course, to be naked is also to be vulnerable to other people. Uh, it's to be relationally vulnerable. And there's no other creature that is naked the way human beings are. Now, people have pointed out to me there is the naked mole rat. All right, so there's one other creature that we call it. It's like it lives underground. And then there are those hairless cats that you can see on the internet. Not that I recommend this. You know, Dr. Evil has one of them. Um, and those are naked cats, I will admit. But basically, every other creature comes into the world with everything it needs to protect itself. And we human beings do not. So here's the interesting, interesting equation. <laughs> Authority plus vulnerability equals image bearing. If you have authority and vulnerability together, you're bearing the image of God, I want to suggest. So what I'm doing right now has authority. I'm speaking. I'm trying to meaningfully act, does, is what I'm doing right now have vulnerability? Kind of. How, what, what is vulnerable? What's risky about what I'm doing? I could say something that I didn't mean to say. I could make a mistake. I could lose track of my words. <laughs> I could spit on someone in the front row. Yeah. I could fail to connect. I could, so this is the thing. To, you probably aren't thinking about this at all, but as I stand up here, I feel tremendous risk. I thought about this when Tanner bravely volunteered. So he took 
authority yesterday in that game. He said, okay, I'll do it, I'll act, right? But then it's incredibly vulnerable to be told, act out Donald Trump, act out a pineapple, right? It's risky. It, did it feel risky? A little bit, a little bit. <laughs> totally. And all true image bearing activity has both things. If you try to have one without the other, it's not image bearing. Authority plus vulnerability is image bearing. So we can do one of my favorite things, which is make a two by two chart here. <laughs> All right? I thought there aren't enough charts on Cambridge uh, regroup retreats, so I wanted a two by two. And so we're going to have authority on the y axis. So the higher up it we go, the more authority you'll have. And then we'll have vulnerability on the x. And so image bearing, bearing the image of God, is to have both authority and to have vulnerability. So now we can map out some alternatives to this. What would it be to have vulnerability without authority? What was a time in your life when you felt very exposed to risk, but you couldn't meaningfully act? What, what would be examples of that? It doesn't have to be your own personal life, but Kyle. Bullying, like you're being bullied. If you're the, the, on the receiving end of yeah. the victim, we might say a bully. So someone else is acting with authority and uh, force even, or, or shaming you, and you feel extremely vulnerable, but you feel like there's nothing you can do. Absolutely. What would be other examples of vulnerability without authority? Um, like at work, your boss. Yes, yeah, so in, in a broken or exploitative work situation, you could feel like the people in power are, are forcing me to do things, uh, that degrade my dignity, that don't respect my image bearing, that don't give me authority. I'm very much at risk, but there's nothing I can do. That's, that's a kind of vulnerability without authority. <laughs> Any other examples? Surgery or being oh, yeah, when you're a patient. When you're sick in some way and you can't help yourself, you rely on other people to help yourself, even in, in surgery, you open yourself up to someone else. So let me give you my kind of bottom line word for what vulnerability without authority is in its most devastating and destructive form. I would say the best word for it is poverty. So poverty is not really mostly about a lack of money. You can actually not have very much money and still have a lot of authority and a lot of proper vulnerability. But if you're someone who has, who's exposed to all kinds of risk, but you can't act to change your situation. That's what poverty is. And most people in the world today live down and to the right in this quadrant. They live in this corner of being very vulnerable, but not being able to change their situation or their circumstances. What would it be to be down and to the left here? So neither authority or vulnerability. You, have, you wouldn't have any power, or at least you wouldn't be using it. Might be being dead, although I think you're actually very vulnerable when you're dead. People can uh, disrespect your, your corpse, and you can't do anything about it. You, you're, you're at great risk in a way. I have a picture of this. I have a couple pictures, actually. So I thought about, okay, what would it be like to not really need to do anything meaningful and also not have any risk. And I kind of thought about, I don't know if you'll think this is fair, I kind of thought about a water park. <laughs> because at the water park, like while we're inside this hotel, how much can we meaningfully do in this hotel? It's limited, right? There's a big world out there that we could act in. But for these two days, we're in this nice, comfortable place. How much risk are you at in a water park? You could drown. I don't, I don't know. I think they've designed the whole thing it's to make it pretty hard to actually be at risk. You could fall and hit your head. There's a little bit of risk. Do you know what is the people's favorite thing to do at this water park, as far as I understand it? There, sometimes there's an hour-long wait to do it. Not the water slide. It's the wave, right? Yeah. which is the one place where you can actually kind of do something with a certain amount of authority and take a certain amount of risk and try something. And that's why it's so popular, because a lot of what we do when we entertain ourselves is put ourselves in places where there's not that much risk. And it's just kind of fun. So when you grow up 
uh, you'll have an option to go to an even bigger water park, which is what I would call a cruise. And when you're on a cruise, it's, it sounds awesome. You're like on this boat. How much authority do you have when you're on a cruise? None. If you try to run the boat, they'll put you in the brig. How much vulnerability do you have on a cruise? The, well, there are those cruises that end up going totally bad. Like the engines give out, you end up circling around in the Gulf of Mexico and spelling out help with your body on the upper deck. But <laughs> in a normal cruise, very little risk. It's, it's extremely safe. So we talked about Pixar yesterday. So one of my other favorite Pixar movies is WALL-E. How many of you have seen WALL-E? Do you know WALL-E? So do you remember the Axiom, right? So the Axiom is like the ultimate cruise ship. And why have human beings uh, gone on the Axiom? Earths, they've laid waste to the Earth. They've decided to leave and go on this kind of cruise while the robots fix it, right? Doesn't work out. What is that? They've decided we're going to give up our authority on the Earth. The image bearers in this story, and by the way, Wally, is totally about Genesis 1, 2, and 3. It's, a, it's about what it is to be an image-bearing human being and how we fail to be image-bearers. So they were given, we, we were entrusted with the earth, but in the story that Wally tells, we've, we've completely failed, and now we give up on our authority, and we decide to just go on this eternal cruise where we'll have no, nothing to do and nothing to risk. And what happens on that eternal cruise? Everybody gets kind of lazier and lazier, fatter and fatter, sits on the you know, little hover chairs and lets the robots do everything. And that sounds great at the beginning. So like a cruise for three days is awesome. It's a great vacation. Water park for two days is great. It, is it good that we're here at the water park? What? I'd, I'd say yes. I'd say it's even very good. Like human beings have taken all kinds of things, taken the good, made it very good. But if we were to, what would happen if we decide just to stay here at the water park for like two years? It would get boring. And boring is a word for frustrated image bearing. When you're bored, what, it, what does it mean when you're bored? It means you are down into the left. So I'll put the axiom down into the left here. There we go. All right. So boredom is when you don't have any authority. You're not taking authority. You're not acting in any meaningful way. And you're not at risk. That's what it is to be bored. And for a few days, this is a totally fine place to visit, to relax, recharge, escape, take a little vacation. It's a terrible place to live. It's actually very close to hell. <laughs> and the word I would use for no authority, no vulnerability is safety. And safety is the place we go to where we say, I'm not going to take any risks. I'm not going to act. I'm just going to withdraw. And it's actually the opposite of image bearing. Because instead of acting meaningfully in the world, taking on meaningful risks, we just decide, I think I'll just opt out. And because we are citizens of the most affluent, powerful empire that has ever existed, a lot of us can choose this every day. We can just decide, I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to risk. One more quadrant, one more corner. What would it be to have authority without vulnerability? Ooh, somebody said God. Huh. Let's think about this. Is God, does God have vulnerability? Yes. How? Why? Jesus. Jesus. How does Jesus show us vulnerability? So vulnerable literally means capable of being wounded. And if Jesus shows us God, the climax of Jesus' life was allowing himself to be impaled, hands, feet, and side, to actually suffer wounds. And we actually believe that the risen body of Jesus still has the wounds. Remember, he showed them to his disciples. Thomas actually felt the wound. So that it turns out the true God is both authority and vulnerability at the same time. That's why image bearers are authority and vulnerability at the same time. But what if we could not have the vulnerability and have all the authority? This is the promise of what I'm going to call idolatry. So an idol is a false god. 
It's a God that does not represent the true God, does not bear the image of the true God, and what every idol promises you is authority without vulnerability. It says you can have all the capacity you want with none of the risk and wounds that you fear. So let's look at this a little closer. Every idol makes two promises. There's two promises every idol makes. And the first is you shall be like God. And the second is you shall not surely die. Does that ring a bell? Ah. Did you read Genesis 3 this morning? What does the serpent say about the fruit? What does he promise will happen? If the woman and the man eat the fruit, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God. That's a funny thing for the servant to promise. Are they like God or not? No. Uh, no, yes. They're made in the image of God. They're actually already mo more like God than any other creature. But the serpent says, you'll be even more like God if you just eat this fruit. And then the woman says, well, we've been told if we eat it, we'll die. And the servant says, oh, no, no, no. You're not vulnerable. You're not dependent on God to live. If you eat this fruit, you'll... You can have as much life as you want. What, is, what are these two promises? It's authority without vulnerability. And the man and the woman take the fruit. They think it'll give them all the authority that they are made for and that there won't be any risk. So here, how does this work in our time? We don't walk around with magical trees in our backyard that we're not supposed to eat. What is it that we use to give ourselves authority without vulnerability. Let me give you an example. So last night I talked about how glorious wine is. So now let's talk about the shadow side. Now when you first are presented with this idol, it's not actually probably going to look like this. It'll probably look more like this. So, um, <laughs> all right, so here's how it works. What is it to be a human being? Part of what it is to be a human being is when you walk into a room of people you don't know, it feels vulnerable, doesn't it? For most of us. Now there are a few of you who are total extroverts and you walked in last night when all the different youth groups, who, and we don't all know each other, right? So you walked in and, and a few of you thought, oh, this is awesome, like 80 friends I haven't met yet. <laughs> the rest of us think you are really weird. <laughs> that is not how we felt, that's not normal. But a few people are like that and awesome, good for you. But I felt vulnerable, I felt it was risky. And I'm a grown-up, like I should not be that insecure, right? But I walk in, I'm like, oh, who am I going to talk to? Where am I going to stand, right? It feels vulnerable to be in a room of people you don't know. What if a year or two from now, freshman year of college, you walk into a big room like that, lots of uh, young people, lots of stuff going on, everyone seems happy, everyone seems to have somebody to talk to, that's going to feel risky. What if I could hand you something that as you consumed it, that sense of vulnerability would start to disappear. And a sense of authority would kind of, your sense of authority would start to increase. Are you following me? <laughs> so you drink this and gradually you'd stop feeling like there's some vulnerability here and you'd be like, hey, this is not so bad. And you'd start to feel, you know, you'd get funnier. Other people would get better looking. Uh, you'd dance more freely. You'd be like, all right, this party is awesome. And the moment you use alcohol to manage your vulnerability in a social situation, you've gone from treating it as a very good part of God's world to using it as an idol because what it's promising you is authority without vulnerability. Now, the amazing thing about all idols is, do, here, let me put it as a question, do idols work? They do work at first. They work at first. If you choose to use alcohol in an addictive way, the first few times you use it this way, it will actually give you a lot of simulated sense of authority and it will take away your sense of vulnerability. The problem is they don't keep working. So they work less and less well. And so you have to take a bigger and bigger dose every time in order to get the benefit, and the effect is less clear. And eventually, the thing that promised you authority without vulnerability, it delivers less and less authority, but the more you worship it, the more vulnerability it exposes you to. 
until eventually the thing that promised you authority without vulnerability now actually is delivering vulnerability without authority. Because what is it to be truly, totally drunk? When you're really drunk, do you, how much capacity for meaningful action do you have? Zero. How much exposure to risk do you have? 100%. A lot. So the very thing that the first few times d delivered authority without vulnerability ends up giving you vulnerability without authority. And this is the way every idol works. Um, you could put it this way. Idols promise almost everything and demand almost nothing. Just take a little sip. It's so easy. You'll be like God. You, you won't surely die. But over time, they deliver less and less. They demand more and more until eventually they deliver nothing and they take over your life. They demand everything. Let's see. What are, uh, let's talk about it. Um, what do people use around you in the places where you live and, and work and study to give them a sense of authority without vulnerability, but that actually in the long run ends up delivering vulnerability without authority? Turn to your neighbors and think out loud about that for a second. Promises them authority without vulnerability, but ends up delivering vulnerability without authority. SUVs and guns. Whoa. Huh. Wow. All right. So uh, guns are a pretty powerful example. Like when you have a gun, you have amazing capacity for action. You can make other people do things, right? And you think this will make me less vulnerable. And maybe if you're the only person with a gun, it does. But when a whole society gets built or whole subcultures get built around protecting themselves with means of violence, actually everyone becomes more vulnerable. And so the thing that started out promising you power ends up delivering powerlessness. I'm not so sure about SUVs. We can talk more about that. <laughs> yeah. Cell phones. Huh. Smartphones. Yeah. I think it's interesting that the most powerful company in our world, you know uh, the most powerful company in our world, what its logo is? It's the fruit. Like the, very, the bitten fruit. And there's no more powerful idol in our world than technology. Because technology makes you feel like, wow, I have all this capacity for action. And often it can make you feel like there's not as much risk. Like, how would you rather break up with someone, in person or over a text message? Uh huh, why? Way less risky. How would you like to ask someone out, like, in person or text message? Text message, oh, in per well, the way, the way to do it is in person because that's image bearing. Authority plus vulnerability. But technology says you can have all that authority. You can, you can send that message without the risk of being present with that person. All right, one or two more examples and then I'll, then I'll be done. You, I've heard too much from you. <laughs> Other folks, yeah, William. Age. Like, as I get older, I'll have more authority, and I won't be as at, at risk. Totally. But actually, over time, we find you get more vulnerable as you age. What? All right. Can you hang with me for, I, I'm trespassing by two minutes. I promise I'll stop soon, but hang with me for, for this long so we can hear a couple more examples. Smith. Popularity. Popularity. Initially, it feels like, as I'm, if I can win that game of being popular, and you have to, Everybody decides, can I play that game or not? And when you start playing that game, initially you'll feel, wow, this gives me all kinds of authority and it actually reduces my risk. Why, why doesn't it keep working? Let's listen to what Samantha says, because this is a really good insight. Um, I think a lot of times it stops working because that person isn't like, taking the honors or things or anything, so they're not telling themselves. Wow. So the problem is, what popularity asks of you is don't, you can't actually be yourself and be popular. That's what it asks. It says just adjust a little bit how you act around other people. But gradually, as you start to feel more vulnerable, it starts asking you to act more and more divergent from who you really are. And eventually, you end up very much at risk because you're not being who you, who you were meant to be. Totally. So many more hands. Uh, I'm going to ignore you. Sorry. I'm going to pick you. And then we'll be done. <laughs> that was vulnerable. Yeah. Absolutely. If I get that job, and if I work hard and get that career, I'll have all the authority I want, all the money I want, and I'll have less risk. If you actually make that your idol, it will end up completely disappointing you. All right, so here's how I want to end. I want to just show you a picture of the world as we have it. 
<laughs> the world that we live in, the world that was meant to be full of image bearers, is now missing the image bearers. <laughs> because the image, I'm going to talk about injustice tonight. Because injustice is just a social system where some people have a lot of authority without vulnerability at the expense of many other people living in poverty. And what we have is a world where the image bearers have decided we don't want to be like the true God. We want to live up and to the left. And because that never really works, <laughs> what it leads to is most people living down and to the right. Most people in our world do not get to bear the image of God because they live in a world where we've chosen idolatry and injustice. And then a few of us can just check into the water park and never check out and live in safety. And the image has been lost in the world. So tonight we're going to talk more about how the image got lost and then how the image is going to be restored. Before we do that, let me just briefly pray. God, I know that in this room, every single one of us, I know every one of us was made to bear the true image. And I also know that every one of us has chosen something that we hope will give us all the authority we want without the vulnerability we fear. And God, I pray you'd rescue us from these things that are getting us in their grip. Ideally, God, rescue us early before they completely destroy us. And help us be part of your story of restoring the image. In Jesus' name we pray.